today we're plunging into, well, the intersection of cutting edge AI theory and the often pretty complex world of quantitative finance. We're using a key source, an article from Quantitativo's Quant Trading Rules called Applying Deep Learning to Enhance Momentum Trading Strategies in Stocks. And our mission here, it's pretty straightforward, really. First, understand this powerful, maybe even, you know, controversial idea from AI history, the bitter lesson. Then we'll look at exactly how someone tried to apply that theory to stock trading. We'll break down the specific strategy they built, the results they actually got. And crucially. And crucially, explore why their outcome was, well, quite different from what the original paper found. Sounds good. Ready to dig in. Let's do it. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more Quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Okay, let's start with that foundation. Richard Sutton's bitter lesson. Now Sutton, he's a real pioneer in AI, reinforcement learning. A giant in the field, basically. Oh, absolutely. A huge figure. His 2019 essay, The Bitter Lesson, it really captures this deep insight from like, 70 years of AI research. So what is the lesson? The bitter part? Well, the lesson, Sutton argues, the most important takeaway is that the most effective methods in AI, they're ultimately the general purpose ones, the ones that just leverage massive computation. And these significantly outperform approaches built on, you know, specific human knowledge or intuition. So it's kind of like brute force computation versus clever human rules. That's the core tension, exactly. We as humans like to build systems based on our understanding, our domain knowledge. We try to hard code how things should work. Makes sense. But history, according to Sutton, shows the real leaps forward haven't come from mimicking us. They've come from leaning into general learning algorithms and just riding that massive wave of increasing computer power. Computation wins in the long run. All right. Which has some pretty big implications for quantitative trading, doesn't it? It really does. I mean, think about it. So many quant strategies are built on rules derived from human understanding of market patterns or anomalies. Like momentum, value, things like that. Exactly. But the bitter lesson suggests maybe spending all that time crafting intricate rules is well, maybe less useful than just throwing powerful data-driven learning algorithms at the problem. That's a provocative thought for quants. So, okay, with that idea in mind, what specifically kicked off the project described in this article? So the author mentions having a background in reinforcement learning and being a big admirer of Sutton, but the direct spark, it came from watching a talk by Nicholas Westray. An ex-Citadel quant, right? Yeah, ex-senior quant at Citadel. Westray was talking about really embracing the bitter lesson, like applying it to forecast stock returns directly from raw limit order book data. Wow, the really granular stuff. His approach was super computation heavy, trying to minimize reliance on traditional financial indicators. And he showed it could work, but it involved huge data sets, massive compute. Not exactly a weekend project. Not at all. Re-implementing Westray's work was just too big for the time available. So the idea became, let's do a toy project. Yeah. Apply the same core idea throw data and compute at predicting returns, but in a simpler setting, just to see if the bitter lesson holds up, you know, <laughs> a proof of concept. Makes sense. A focus test. How did they pick the simpler strategy to model? Well, they searched specifically for deep learning momentum stocks. Okay. Deep learning for the computation side of the bitter lesson, right? And momentum, because it's a well-known, pretty persistent anomaly in stocks, a good place to test if computation could find that signal. So they looked at a few papers. Yeah, and they ended up choosing this one by Takuchi and Lee, applying deep learning to enhance momentum trading strategies in stocks, even though apparently it seemed almost too simple at first glance. Why avoid complexity? Isn't finance complex? It is, but they deliberately avoided papers that relied heavily on feature engineering. Meaning? Meaning where humans carefully craft lots of specific indicators based on market knowledge. That felt like it went against the bitter lesson spirit, which is more about letting the computation discover patterns from less processed data. Got it. Let the machine do the work. Mm. Okay, let's get into the strategy details then. 
the nitty gritty. What data do they actually use? Right, U.S. stocks, NYSE, AMX, NASDAQ, but they filtered out stops trading below $5. Why do that? Just to avoid some of the noise and weird microstructure effects you get with penny stocks. Keep it cleaner. Okay, and the time period? Daily price data going way back, January 1st, 1990, right up to the present. A long history. Now, the inputs to the model, they didn't just use raw prices. They derived 33 specific features. Okay, what kind of features? Well, 12 were monthly cumulative returns, looking back from month T13 to T2. So, capturing the past year's performance, roughly, but skipping the very last month. Why skip the last month? Common practice to avoid potential short-term reversal effects or look-ahead bias creeping in. Focus on the more stable, longer-term momentum signal. Okay, makes sense. What else? Then 20 features were daily cumulative returns from the most recent month, month T. So capturing the fresher, short-term action. A mix of long and short-term. Exactly. And one last feature, just a symbol flag, a dummy variable, for whether the next month was January to account for that known January effect anomaly. Interesting mix. How did they prep this data before feeding it to the model? Two main steps. First, convert those returns into cumulative returns. Second, and this is key, apply cross-sectional Z-score standardization. Z-scores. Basically means comparing each stock's feature value to the average and standard deviation of all other stocks on that same day. It puts everything on a level playing field. So a high volatility stocks return is compared fairly to a low volatility stocks return. It lets the model compare across the universe. Right, crucial for comparing different stocks. And what was the model actually trying to predict from these 33 features? It was framed as a binary classification task. Simple yes-no prediction. Yes-no on what? For each stock on each day, predict. Will its return next month be above the median return of all stocks for that month? Label one for yes, above median, label zero for no, below median. So predicting relative outperformance, not an exact return number. Exactly, which is often more stable and achievable in finance. Okay, and the model itself, the deep learning part. They used a feed-forward neural network, or FFNM, pretty standard architecture, took the 33 inputs, processed them through a few hidden layers. Interestingly, they included a layer with only four units, a bottleneck or compression layer. Why do that? The idea is to force the network to learn a really compressed, efficient representation of the input data to find the most salient patterns. Then it expanded out again before making the final prediction, the probability of being class one versus class zero. And training, how did they actually teach this network? They trained it end to end, directly on the data, yeah. which is actually a difference from the original 2013 paper. Oh, how did the original paper do it? The original used something called Stacked Restricted Boltzmann Machines, RBMs, for unsupervised pre-training first, then fine-tuned the network. That pre-training stuff was pretty common back then, partly because training deep networks directly was harder, computationally more demanding. But now, with modern hardware, frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow, better ways to initialize the network weights, better optimization algorithms, you can often just train these things end-to-end -end effectively even with noisy financial data. So they skipped the pre-training. Interesting how the tech advancements change the practical approach. How did they make sure the testing was fair given its time series data? They used a rolling window cross-validation framework, essential for finance. How does that work? You basically simulate reality. You train the model on a chunk of past data, say several years, then you validate on the next chunk, maybe a year. You test it on the chunk after that. Then you slide the whole window forward, Drop the oldest data, add new data, and repeat. Train, validate, test, over and over. So it's always predicting the future relative to its training data. Exactly. It prevents the model from peeking into the future, avoids data leakage, and gives a much more robust estimate of how the strategy would actually perform out of sample. Okay, solid setup. So they retrieve the data, pre-process it, set up the model and the rolling validation. Yeah. What were the key steps in actually running the experiment? Pretty standard machine learning workflow, really. Get the data, apply the filtering and z-scoring to find that binary target variable. Then the training loop, feed data in mini batches, use an optimizer like Adam to adjust the network weights, calculate the log prediction error. Try to minimize that error. Right. Keep track of performance on the validation set as you train and save the model that performs best on that unseen validation data. Prevents overfitting to the training set. Makes sense. And once you have these saved models from each window, how do you get the final predictions for the test periods? You run the test data through the best model saved from the corresponding training validation window. The model outputs a probability for each stock. 
the probability it thinks the stock belongs to class one, meaning it will outperform the median next month. Okay, so you get a probability score for every stock. Exactly. And then crucially for each test state, they took all the stocks and sorted them based on that predicted probability. Then they grouped them into 10 buckets or quantiles. Quantiles. Yeah. Quantile one has the stocks the model is least confident will outperform, lowest probability of being class one. Quantile 10 has the stocks the model is most confident will outperform, highest probability. Ah, so you're ranking stocks based on the model's confidence. Precisely. And that ranking is often where the real value lies, especially if the raw accuracy isn't super high. Right. Okay. The moment of truth then. The results. How did this deep learning momentum strategy actually perform after all that? Let's start with that raw classification accuracy you mentioned. Across the whole test period, looking at the confusion matrix, it was about 52% accurate. 52%. As you said, barely better than a coin flip. Yeah, on the surface, it doesn't sound amazing, does it? Only slightly better than random guessing. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty symmetrical, about 52% accurate for predicting outperformers, class 1, and 52% for underperformers, class 0. No strong bias. So why isn't that just noise? Why is that potentially meaningful in finance? It's a really key point. Because financial data is so noisy, the signal-to-noise ratio is incredibly low. Even a small, consistent edge, like being right 52% of the time instead of 50%, can be economically very significant if you apply it systematically, especially at scale. You don't need to predict every stock perfectly. Okay, so the slight edge matters. But you said the ranking, the quantiles were key. What did that show? This is where it gets really interesting. When they looked at the average performance, the annualized return for the stocks within each of those 10 quantile buckets, they found a clear monotonic relationship. Monotonic meaning. Meaning returns steadily increase as you went from quantile 1 up to quantile 10. It wasn't noisy. It was a consistent trend. Wow. So the model's confidence ranking actually correlated strongly with future returns. Absolutely. The stocks, the model was least confident about quantile 1. They actually had a negative average annualized return minus 0.64%. So the model was good at picking losers. Okay. And the stocks it was most confident about Quantile 10 had the highest average return, a very healthy 13.0% per year. 13%. That's a huge difference between the bottom and the top. It's a big spread, yeah. About 13.6 percentage points between Quantile 10 and Quantile 1. This really demonstrates the predictive power isn't just in the binary yes-no, but in the model's ability to rank the likelihood of future outperformance. It clearly separates the potential winners from the losers, especially at the extremes. Okay, that makes a 52% accuracy make more sense, the values in the ranking. How did that translate into a simulated trading strategy, like buying the top quantile and shorting the bottom one? That's exactly the strategy they backtested. Long quantile 10, short quantile 1. Yeah, the results. The long short strategy generated an annualized return of 12.8% over the test period. 12.8%. How does that compare to just, say, holding the S&P 500 over the same time? Good question. The article notes the S&P 500 benchmark returned about 7.0% annualized over that period. So significantly better raw returns, nearly double. Yeah, clear up performance on the return side. But maybe even more impressive are the risk metrics. Okay. The strategy achieved a sharp ratio of 1.03. Sharp ratio. Measures your return relative to the risk you took, the volatility, higher is better. A sharp over 1.0 is generally considered quite good, excellent even. And the S&P 500 benchmark. Its sharp was just over 0.5. So the strategy delivered much better risk-adjusted returns. More bang for your risk buck, essentially. That's compelling. What about drawdowns? The painful losing streaks. Also much better. The strategy's maximum drawdown, the biggest peaked trough loss, was 24%. Which sounds like a lot. But compare it to the benchmark. The S&P 500 had a max drawdown of 52.6% during that period. So the strategy offered significantly better downside protection, less than half of the worst loss. And one more thing, the strategy had a negative correlation to the overall market. Meaning it tended to do well when the market did poorly, and vice versa. Or at least its returns weren't strongly tied to the market's ups and downs. That's valuable for diversification if you're adding this to a larger portfolio. Wow. Okay, so let's recap the results. Even with only 52% raw accuracy, by using the model's confidence to rank stocks, going long the most confident picks and shorting the least confident. They built a strategy that beat the market on return, dramatically beat it on risk-adjusted return, Sharp had much smaller drawdowns, and offered diversification. That's the summary. It really highlights that finding rankable signal, even a weak one, and exploiting the extremes can be very powerful in quant finance. 
the computation found something useful. Impressive. Yeah. But you mentioned earlier that these results, while good, were still a far cry from the original 2013 paper they were partly inspired by. That's right. The author is very clear about this. The 12.8% return and 1.03 sharp are solid, but apparently much lower than what Takuchi and Lee reported back in 2013. So what happened? Why the big discrepancy? What are the likely reasons? Well, they list several potential factors, and it's a good lesson in the challenges of replicating quant research. First, the data set was different, different source, and significantly smaller than the original study likely used. Data matters a lot. Okay, data differences. What else? The time horizon. This replication tested on a more recent period, including the years after 2009 up to the present. The original paper stopped in 2009. Market regimes change, right? What worked pre-financial crisis might work differently after. True, markets definitely evolve. Then there's the model training difference we discussed. End-to-end -end training here versus RBM pre-training in the original. That could definitely lead to different model nuances and performance. Right, methodology. And the evaluation protocol. This used rolling window cross-validation, which is generally seen as more robust. The original might have used a simpler fixed train to split, which can sometimes flatter results. Mm, okay. And just, you know, the passage of time. It's been over a decade since that original paper. Markets get more efficient. Anomalies can decay as more people discover and trade them. The edge might simply be smaller now. So it's likely a combination of data, time period, methods, and market evolution. Mm -hmm. Makes sense why exact replication is so tough. Any other potential issues flagged? There was one interesting point raised in the comments on the source article about that $5 price filter. Yeah, removing the cheap stocks. Right. The critique was that by removing those stocks before training the model, even if you don't intend to trade them, you might inadvertently introduce a kind of survivorship bias. The model never learns patterns from those potentially distressed or failing companies, which could subtly skew the patterns it learns from the survivors. Ah, that's a subtle but important data hygiene point for backtesting. Okay, so accepting that replication is hard and results differed. What was the final verdict on the main goal? Did this toy project serve as a proof of concept for Richard Sutton's bitter lesson? The author argues, and I think it's a fair point, that yes, it did. Despite not matching the original paper's numbers, the experiment achieved its core purpose. Which was? To test the principle. Can computation, specifically deep learning, find a valuable signal in financial data without relying heavily on predefined, human-engineered financial indicators? And the answer seems to be yes. By using a clean pipeline, fairly raw, price-derived features, and letting the neural network learn embracing that computation first, bitter lesson approach, they did extract a meaningful signal. A signal strong enough to build a profitable strategy beating the benchmark on risk-adjusted terms. Exactly. It showed that even in a complex, noisy domain like finance, focusing on scaling computation and general learning methods can yield positive, practical results. It finds edges human intuition might miss or struggle to codify. So, the bitter lesson principle seems to hold up, even if the specific magnitude of the results varies over time or with implementation details. That seems to be the takeaway here. Computation can find the signal. Okay. So what does this all mean for you listening? This deep dive shows how a pretty profound, maybe even slightly uncomfortable idea from AI theory. Sutton's bitter lesson isn't just academic. It can be applied and tested in the real messy world of financial markets. Mm -hmm. We've walked through the details of one specific attempt, the data, the model, the training, we saw the results, which were promising in their own right, highlighting the importance of ranking and risk-adjusted returns, even if they didn't match past glories. And we explored the very real reasons why replicating quantitative research is so challenging in markets that are constantly shifting beneath our feet. It really leads to a bigger question, doesn't it? If computation can find these kinds of edges in super noisy financial data, largely without needing us to tell it what financial patterns to look for, where else could this computation-first philosophy unlock surprising insights? What other complex problems, maybe in science or business or fields you care about, might benefit from letting powerful learning algorithms loose on raw data rather than relying solely on established human expertise? That is definitely something to think about. Where else can the bitter lesson be applied? Thanks for going on this deep drive with us. 